Take a little trip with me, I'm gonna take you home. Take a little history. Take a little, take a little. Down this lane of memory. So let's raise another glass for the glorious past and the friends we have become. Yeah, yeah. Cause little did we know that good times come and go, but the best is yet to come. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. My guest is one of India's best known activists and authors, Farah Naqvi. What does she make of the Delhi riots that have just ended? Farah Naqvi, let's start with your report released yesterday, Friday, on the parts of the city affected by the riots that you visited. You write, reports coming out have not done justice to the extent of the violence and its cost in terms of the emotional, psychological and economic damage to survivors in Delhi. Give me some sense of how bad it was. You know, the reason we wrote that, those specific words, are because our understanding of communal or targeted violence in India tends to become restricted to counting the death toll. And uh, the media invariably focuses on how many people died. What we've seen over the years is a change in the pattern of targeted violence. And in Muzaffar Nagar also we saw that where the death toll was about 60, but the displacement was massive and the fear, the polarization, the ghettoization that it leads to was huge. We saw the same thing in, in Northeast Delhi um, when we were there day before yesterday. Uh, it, and you see the pain in the eyes of people who have not only, and the pain is not only from people who've lost properties or who've lost family and friends, um, it is the pain of being abandoned, uh, of being abandoned by your country, by your city, by your government. There is a sense of bewilderment almost. And people have a combination, it's that unique look in a person's eyes when it's both anger, fear and despair. And uh, that is what we mean when we say there is a cost to this that no news report can accurately capture. Um, that sense of bereavement is a bereavement for, um, for a lost trust in, in where you live. And that is what, what you see everywhere, you hear everywhere. So you're saying to understand the full horror of what happened, you actually have to go see, feel and experience it yourself. Words cannot describe it. Newspapers cannot capture it. Yes, and, but also newspapers tend to, you know, so there will be a report from one mohalla. And newspapers are also bound, uh, rightly so perhaps. Uh, there is a journalistic ethic. You don't want to exacerbate an already volatile situation. People are careful sometimes in, in how they write it. Um, my, our job uh, to go in there was not to exacerbate anything, but to try and express the emotion uh, and the consequences. Uh, it's a very, um, you know, the report doesn't make any recommendations. It was a very quick report. We did it in one day. Um, but what it does try and do is give a broad sense of the range of things that we need to look at when we look at the consequences of this kind of hate. In fact, one of the points you make, and you write, the targeting of Muslims in Northeast Delhi reminded one distinctly of the targeting of Sikhs in Delhi in 1984 and of Muslims in Gujarat 2002. The targeting is clearly and unambiguously focused on Muslims. Can I ask, what sort of things led you to this conclusion? You go to both mohallas, you go to Hindu neighborhoods and you go to Muslim neighborhoods and you get a clear sense of the difference in emotion. Um, I don't know what the eventual death toll, how it will, and it's, it's terrible to even be talking in these terms, how many were Hindus and how many were Muslim, uh, but that is just an in inevitable part of the, of the times we live in. Uh, as always, the death toll among Muslims will be higher. Uh, the damage to properties, the displacement, I suspect is almost entirely among Muslims. We did not hear any stories 
of displacement of people running away uh, from the Hindus that we spoke to. And we did speak to both sets of people. Uh, among some of the, the Hindus that we spoke to, uh, they said, uh, no, we trust the police. Uh, you could not find a single Muslim anywhere who said they would trust the police. But I must add that a large number of Hindus, ordinary Hindus who live perhaps in Muslim majority areas were furious. They were furious with the absolute abdication of the Delhi police, the tragedies of people calling that 100 number 48 hours, 72 hours, nobody on the ground. You know, when in a crisis there is no response, what do, what do people, you know, think about it, Karan? If there's a theft in your home, what, what do you do? If there's arson in your house, if there is a murder, what, what, do peop, what do ordinary people, you expect to be able to turn to your law and order machinery? And when you needed them, they were missing. Absolutely, completely, 100% is the account we heard on the ground is that the police were either missing or they were with the rioters. And we've seen enough evidence of that. You make one more point in your report. You say, even though the violence has stopped, fear is everywhere. What is the emotional state of the survivors? What can I say? I mean, it is there is fear when you've been attacked for no reason other than for who you are. That is a very, very fundamental fear that you will now carry around with you for the rest of your life. So these people feel alone, unprotected and very, very scared. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I might add that the, the very recently elected AAP government, um, which probably got a large number of votes from people in these areas, um, has not responded. They've not been there to hold hands. And this abdication of responsibility saying, look, you know, police is not in our control. That, that's fine. We do understand that. But, you know, executive power and moral power uh, can be two different things. AAP spokesmen keep insisting that AAP MLAs have been actually in their districts. They've been there talking. They've been there meeting families. You're suggesting to me that is what they say on TV. It's not the truth. You know, I can't deny that some AAP people may have been there. I certainly didn't see them, but I was there for one day. The point is, what is the general sense? What is the mood on the ground? They are saying, AAP did not stand with us. Koi nahi aya. If you hear this in a single day from a cross-section of 50 people that you speak to, you have to believe them. I mean, I cannot bring evidence uh, to this interview saying whether they were or were not. They are not seen. They are not, that the feeling, the mood among people is very clear that AAP did not stand with us in our hour of crisis so soon after we voted for them. And that has to be the clincher. If the people concerned and affected feel AAP didn't stand with them, didn't come to comfort them, didn't come to reassure them, no amount of insistence by AAP that they did is sufficient. The people are what matter and they say, AAP wasn't there. Yes. What about the re political response of the Modi government? Amit Shah, the Home Minister, has been silent and that continues to be the case up till today. The Prime Minister did speak, but by tweet, 69 hours of the riots began. And although he called for calm, he showed no compassion for the dead and he showed no concern for the next of kin. Has his response gone down in any way with the people or do they feel we've been left by the government as well? You know, I suspect the expectations from the central government are so low um, that it barely comes up. The only time it came up was in conversations in Mustafabad uh, when people pointed to the Trump visit and said, this is what our government was busy with while we were dying. Um, and is that why they delayed deployment of forces? Why wasn't the army called in? These are the kinds of questions that people have asked. But I don't believe, Karan, and in all honesty, I don't think you do either, that there is an expectation that the central government will go there and stand with the people. And, uh, but I did expect the chief minister, I did expect and hope that Arvind Kejriwal, Mr. Manish Sisodia, the deputy CM, would go there as, you know, this is their 
they have moral, they should have exerted. These are their voters, these are the people who brought them to power. Just on a humanitarian basis, exert moral authority, stand there with people, have large, um, have sabhas, have armed sabhas at corners. You can handle so many sabhas in one day. Say, we stand with you, we will do whatever in our power to, to assuage your pain and to reassure you of your full citizenship in this country. And you're making a very important distinction between the expectation people have of Kejriwal and the Ahmadmi Party government and Mr. Modi, Mr. Shah and the BJP. They don't expect anything from Mr. Modi and therefore when Mr. Modi either doesn't respond or does so in a very clinical fashion and shows no compassion, it doesn't hurt them. But when Ahmadmi Party fails to be with them, they feel betrayed and let down. Yes. Look, wh why would they expect anything from the central government, from a BJP-led government, when almost everybody across the board will say that this entire violence has been instigated by hate speech, by a BJP person, by Mr. Kapil Mishra. There is no action against You don't them. expect compassion from the people who are your attackers. Right. What about the response of the police? To begin with, the police actually said in open court to Justice Muralidhar that they hadn't seen the hate speech videos associated with Anurag Thakur, Pravesh Singh Varma, Kapil Mishra. Yes. And it's absolutely clear that they have no intention of filing FIRs against any hate speech, at least till the 23rd of March, and maybe not even to the next hearing, which is the 13th of April. Yes. How do you respond to this attitude from the police? What does it tell you about the police? What does it tell what does it tell you about the police? That you're completely abdicating your all your duties. This is dereliction of duty beyond belief. This is the police is culpable for not acting. You it's your sworn duty when you swear oath as a police officer. You have to file an FIR when there's a cognizable offence that you're, that offence is being committed by somebody that you're standing shoulder to shoulder with. Uh, uh, when Kapil Mishra made these comments, essentially threatening uh, violence, uh, he was standing next to a police officer a for DCP? heaven's sake. A Mr. DCP. Surya. Yes. So you know what what. What does that tell you, Karan? What does it tell you about the police? And I imagine that that message that the DCP didn't act, he stood there and smiled, Ji. went across very strongly to people in these affected areas. They must have said from that moment, ye to humare saath kabhi bhi ho sakta. And it said to the rioters, police humare saath hai, right? It's giving you a carte blanche. The police, the impression you get is that they will protect us, which is what the word impunity is all about. Hey guys, we've got a two, three day deadline. Let's just get out on the streets, create mayhem, because the police is going to shield us through acts of both omission and commission. Now, there are several videos on social media of the way the police behave. Gee. Some show the police simply standing by and watching as Muslim homes and Muslim shops are set afire. There are others, even more horrifying, where the police themselves are prodding young Muslim boys with sticks and lattes, and one of those boys has, in fact, since then died. Yes. Three or four days have gone by since these began being circulated. There's total silence from the police, total silence from the government. What do you make of that? You know, the young man who died, Fezan. when I first saw that video, my heart just completely broke. It was... Look, th these are acts of plain and simple murder. This is an act, in my mind, of murder committed by the Delhi police against a citizen of this country. And if we don't act now, it, all it does, Karan, is show you the absolute state of emergency that we are living in when there is this kind of impunity in full public display. You know, the difference in between now and many decades ago is that you now have video evidence. There is no shielding you from, you know, from denial. You know, this, we didn't do it. This is all lies. People have cooked it up. You know, none of, none of these are, are, are plausible anymore. WhatsApp videos are proof they did it. 
Absolutely and they are being vetted, they can be checked for accuracy and authenticity and this video has been checked. And the amazing thing is that neither the government at the central government level nor the police have felt a need to have to explain, leave aside, defend themselves. There's utter silence as if it doesn't matter, they are indifferent. You know, you're asking me questions to which, what kind of an answer can I give? Yes, they are indifferent. Yes, there is complete impunity. Yes, the police is accountable. And this is, as far as I'm concerned, a, a, a murder by, by the police of this, of this young man being prodded while he's wounded, being made to sing national anthem. And there's anthem. no acknowledgement of that by the police even now. You know, I saw the press police conference. were approached by the Indian Express. They don't even acknowledge it's happened. They have nothing to say. What can I say? Sadly, this is not the first time the Delhi police have behaved unprofessionally in just the last six months. It began in December in Jamia when they barged into the university, damaged the library, thrashed the students. Ji. A few days later in January, they stood by and let the violence in JNU happen. And the question I ask is this, in your eyes, is this a sign that they're acting at the behest of their political masters or are they incompetent? Is it complicity or incompetence? If you give me a choice between both the words, I would say complicity, absolutely. I'm sure there is incompetence as there is incompetence in, in institutions uh, across the board um, and there is incompetence of various degrees. But what you're seeing over here is absolutely clear uh, instructions from higher ups, but you're also seeing a communalized police machinery. It is easy to accept these instructions because it, it resonates. It resonates with some poison that has entered your own system. Um, and that is something that is, that is of, of grave concern going forward. No doubt this is why you and Harshmandar approached the Delhi High Court to set up a special investigation team to inquire into the rights. At that stage, the Delhi High Court didn't grant it. But subsequently, the police have set up two SITs of their own. In your eyes, does that meet your requirements or does it still fall woefully short? Look, at the moment, the, the SITs can be set up, but the, the people who are heading these SITs, um, at least one of them, uh, was, was pulled back during the elections. Because Mr. he, Deo. correct, because uh, so we, you know he does and not Mr. have. And Mr. Turkey, a, the other person, was the one who was revealing photographs of who he claimed were the culprits at JNU, but they were very carefully selected to leave out the ABVP people. So what does that tell you about the kind of trust? So and you faith don't we believe that these do? two SITs actually meet your and Harshmandra's demand? You wanted, I presume an SIT that would function under the judiciary, or at least the Delhi High Court? Yeah, a retired, a retired judge. But at, at the moment, the crisis, Karan, is it's beyond police culpability today. There is a human crisis on the ground. And we need to understand that as a city, as citizens, as governments, this is the capital city of India. It's my city. I was born here. You've lived here all your life. Today we are watching people fleeing our city in fear. This is not acceptable and we need to appeal to all of India today, beyond Delhi police, beyond state and central governments to say, get out there, be on the ground, prevent this. This is an appeal to the conscience of the country. Absolutely, absolutely. We need to do that. We are watching this country just completely be, be shattered across fault lines that have been artificially nurtured, created. Um, this kind of hate is not going to do our country any good. It's not going to help us going forward. There is culpability. There is an, in a, 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 a compromised police. There is a corrupt police. And corruption for me is not monetary corruption. There is corruption of moral the conscience. Moral corruption. Moral corruption. Corruption of the conscience. All of these things in our institutions that are flourishing under this current government. You began by, and I quoted you in your report, saying that there were similarities between 84 and what happened in Delhi in terms of the targeting of Muslims. Are there also similarities with 84 in terms of the way the police and the government have responded? Yes, across the board. 
You read any of the 84 reports and you will understand what targeting means. And then this targeting we saw again in Gujarat in 2002. Uh, this is not a, the, our language needs to change. These are not riots. A riot is I chuck a stone, you chuck one back, perhaps I chuck five more and maybe you respond only with one. But a riot is a, is a local conflagration. We used to see riots once upon a time in old Delhi. We used to see them in parts of Hyderabad. These were strong men from two communities. These were turf wars. They were different in nature. This has evolved into singular targeting with the help of a state machinery with, in which one side is getting beaten down. These are not, so we need to change so our language. So would you call this a pogrom? No, I would, I would call this targeted violence. And the word targeting is very, very important when a car owned by one community is burnt and a car owned by another community is not. You, it is to any human being, you walk through your neighborhood and you say, oh my God, one house burnt to a cinder, house on left fine, house on right fine. And the house in the middle that's burnt is a Muslim house. Is a Muslim, is a house that has been targeted because of who lives there. Who has this kind of information? You this know? is what you mean when you say that the targeting is unambiguously against Muslims in Delhi, just as it was unambiguously against the Sikhs in 84. Yes. And unambiguously against Muslims in Gujarat in 2002. Absolutely. In other words, we've gone back to a pattern of targeted deliberate violence that we saw in the 80s and we saw again in the very, very early 2000s. 18 years later, we've gone right back to that. Yes, we have. There are differences. And the difference I pointed to was a pattern we saw beginning with, with Muzaffar Nagar. Is that in this day of television media, you're not going to see the kinds of death tolls that we saw in, in Gujarat and in, in 84 in Delhi. You see a lower death toll, but you see the devastation to lives the displacement, the ghettoization, the polarization, much worse. And the targeting, however, remains precisely the Absolutely. same. Absolutely. And yes. the intention behind the targeting is, I'm attacking one lot of people, defined by their religion, yes. because I see them as the other or as the enemy. You know, I wouldn't even use the word religion, Karan. Uh, this is not about religion. This is about an identity. Um, and it's, it's not about... You know, this is not about practicing Muslims. It's not about saying your religion is Anyone worse than mine. Anyone called a Muslim has yes. that identity. It's, yeah, you know, what's it's, in a name? It's, but it's, it's Islam as identity rather than Islam as faith. Correct. When the UPA was in power, you were a member of the National Advisory Council. And at that time, you proposed a communal violence bill, which never saw the light of day. Has your experience of Delhi convinced you that this is needed more than ever before? Look. When the Jyoti Pandey case, rape case happened, we brought in, uh, and, and I worked on that as well, uh, a whole new set of laws to reform, to reform the statute books. This was the Criminal Law um, Amendment Act that was brought in in 2013. Justice Varma's committee. Correct. Post that. So th the amendment came in 2013. Um, please tell me what is the current rape conviction. Okay. It is probably in the range of 27%, 25%. My point being simply this that no law on earth can prevent what has happened in Delhi, whether it was that communal violence bill uh, or any other. Laws exist in an ecosystem. Laws are also part of a large social consensus. And laws also exist to create a moral benchmark for us as a society that a certain kind of behavior is unacceptable. And they only work if the people they're enforced upon accept them. At the moment, you have a complete breakdown of a social consensus on communal polarization. But I do want to, if you give me a few minutes, I do want to say that, yes, that bill that was proposed in 2011 uh, is so elements of that are, we do not in India today have any definition of even a hate crime, let alone targeted violence. That bill did that. It created an offense of dereliction of duty of police officers. It did away with the need to get sanction to prosecute them. That, that's, that's a shift forward. We, it, and what it did very, very categorically was 
create a national standard for compensation. Do you know what the what the history of this thing called compensation money that is thrown at victims has been? In Nelly, in 1983, the compensation given was 5,000 rupees. Just a year later, when the massacre happened in Delhi against the Sikhs, do you know what the first announcement was? 10,000 rupees. In 87, it went up to 20,000 rupees. The Nanavati Commission came, they brought it up by 3.5 lakhs. In 2014, uh, under Manmohan Singh, they then raised it. What I am saying is that the compensation becomes some kind of an arbitrary largesse. And it needs to be fixed and formalized and Ab not left to the arbitrary whim of people who make up their minds. Yeah, to a government likes you, a government, they have a certain politics to play. Delhi is the capital, someone's putting pressure, let's do it. In Bhagalpur, 89, you know, the same story. So, you so, give so a little, would I be you right a little? in saying that the real need for a communal violence bill today is for two causes. One, it would be an effective way of ensuring that once this happens, it's contained, contained quickly. People who are required to act are required to act instantly because otherwise they would be punished. And the second thing is because there would be these deterrents, perhaps there's a chance such horrible violence won't happen so often. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of dodgy on the, on the deterrent value of any law, uh, frankly. The containment but yes, value? The, look, we needed such a law. We still need such a law. We need to define targeted violence. We need the police to act under fear of, of penal provisions, that you will serve jail time if we take you to court saying you did not perform your duties without needing a sanction prosecutor. That's very, very so important. So never again can a Mr. Surya DCP stand beside Kapil Mishra and smile as Kapil Mishra comes up with inflammatory statements because Mr. Surya will know if I don't act, I'll be the one who'll end up in jail. I may be the one who will end up in jail. But most important, Karan, given today, given the time we are talking in today, we need something to cast a statutory justiciable duty on state governments to provide relief, rehabilitation to people. At the moment, there is nothing. The, the, for example, the government is not bound by law today to provide anything. And as of today, there are no relief camps. So the communal violence bill would actually ensure that governments fulfill their duties and not evade them. Yeah, yeah. In terms of basic relief, rehabilitation, reparation, internal displacement, all of those were cast as statutory duties on a state. So I could take this government to court saying, this is the law, sir. You have not implemented this law. I can take you to court. At the moment, it's up to the whims of the government. At the moment, it's a moral response as far as the government is concerned. You're making it a statutory requirement, which if they don't fulfill, you can go to court. That, that, those were provisions in, in that law, yes. Let's take a break at that point. When I come back, I want to move away from politics entirely and ask you a very different set of questions. Ji. After six years of Narendra Modi, what does it feel like to be a Muslim in India? We'll be back in a moment's time. But first, a message from our sponsor, Glenn Livet, whilst I take a reassuring sip from this glass. Take a little trip with me, I'm gonna take you home. Take a little history. Take a little, take a little. Down this lane of memory. So let's raise another glass for the glorious past and the friends we have become. Yeah, yeah, cause little do we know. The good times come and go, but the best is yet to come. Welcome back to a very special interview for The Wire. My guest is the well-known activist and author, Farah Naqvi. Farah Naqvi, I want to move away from politics in this past and ask you a very different sort of question. For the last six years, there's been frequent periodic targeting of Muslims, not just in terms of messages, but also in terms of measures. We've had love jihad and ghar wapsi. We've had cow lynching and anti-Romeo squads. And in the last six months, we've had Article 370, the championing of the Ram Mandir verdict, and then most recently CAA and NRC. At the end of all of this, what does it feel like to be a Muslim in Modi's India? You know, it's a lot less fun than it used to be. Being a Muslim in this country was, look, what all everything you've described, essentially, the the core of all of it 
is the reduction of a person to a religious identity or to a single identity. I am a woman, I am a feminist, I am an Indian, I am a Muslim and all of these in no particular order surface at different points in my life. What this politics has done, look you've pointed to specific instances of you know this is all part of a larger, larger politics and this is a stingy politics. It's a reductive politics. It seeks to reduce all of us, not just me, but you as well, to, to an, uh, the most singular element of your identity that may or may not be the most important one to you. But that is how you are increasingly seen. That is how you need to respond. That is how, so that has been the, the greatest tragedy that I experience is, is, a, is a reduction. And, and that takes away agency, right? It takes away my agency to be freely who I am. And I can give you sort of examples of how this feeling unfolds uh, in a person. Look, as someone who's worked on communal violence, you begin to get a, a, a very um, exacerbated sense of these fault lines when you enter any situation post a post a, a pogrom like the kind we saw in Gujarat. And I'll, and I'll give you an example of what it's meant for my identity as a Muslim in India. Uh, I grew up in a home in which there were, uh, there were believers and namazis and there is, everybody grows up in homes where there are all kinds of people. The home I grew up in and the person that I chose to be meant that I used to frequently, this was very common in our home, uh, I used to frequently wear a bindi. My mother wears a bindi. Um, and actually when you go to Bangladesh, you discover the number of large number of Muslims who because bindi was not a marker of religious identity. It was a marker of, of a regional or a cultural identity. So you see the Bengalis and the Bangladeshis all look pretty much the same. Um, I used to wear a bindi. I went to Gujarat for the first fact finding shortly after the violence and I discovered when I went to a, a camp full of terrified, completely violated Muslims, I would take that bindi off. When I went to meet a Maya Kodnani who was one of the culprits, um, I would feel comfortable wearing that bindi. And during those, those were such fraught days that bindi went on and off and on and off so many times that it lost all aesthetic pleasure for me. And from 2002 onwards, I lost my bindi. I could not wear it. I would look in the mirror and there was something about what used to be a beautiful, just an aesthetic marker and pleasure that I took uh, in, in that. My, I would feel when I wore certain clothes, that I would feel naked without a bindi on my face. That bindi was taken away from me because an aesthetic thing became such a fraught thing for me. And I think it's only a few years ago that I, I sort of dared to put one on again and I wasn't quite sure how I felt. That to me is essentially what this politics does and what it's done to me as, as a Muslim is that it threatens my pluralism. It, it threatens my, my identity, which is so multiple. In fact, it refuses to see you in any other terms but Muslim. Exactly. And there's a lot more to you than just religion. Absolutely. And it's even possible, religion is just inherited through your parentage. It's not something you personally believe in. That and yet you're seen in that light regardless. So nobody comes and asks, you know, before they hit you, nobody is going to ask you, are you a practicing Muslim uh, or, or not? That's irrelevant. You're reduced to your name. And that is just, that is just, that's just terrible. You've explained tellingly, emotionally, what the impact of six years of Modi has been on you. What about Muslims who live in small towns and villages in Rajasthan, Haryana, UP, Bihar, Bengal? Do they feel discriminated against? Do they feel threatened? Worst of all, do they feel in their own country unwanted? Yes, categorically yes. Look, discrimination and th the point is, you know, the Hindu-Muslim fault line 
or the idea that there is discrimination against Muslims, this is not something that Mr. Modi invented. Right? There are fault lines in our society. There are caste fault lines in our society. The job of moral leadership in any pluralist democracy is to bring out the best in people, not to excavate and bring out and, and, and create, uh, bring out the absolute worst in a person. And that's what Modi that's is what doing. That's what this government has done. It's, we, cannot, we cannot blame or credit them with creating the fault lines. They were there, certainly. They've exacerbated them. They have, they have allowed them to flourish. That, that is all they are. Is, is they exist precisely on this fault line. And that is the worst thing they have done to all of India. And so you're saying that Modi's six years have left Muslims feeling unwanted in their own country. They have left them feeling very scared, Karan. Um, scared, vulnerable. Unwanted is, a, is too big a word uh, right now. There is a what you've seen in the in the anti CA vulnerable and threatened very much so very very look I mean even I am aware of my name I go to a store and I'm aware of my name I, I am at every point so this is this is a cross class divides is that ultimately you're being boiled down to your name that vulnerability exists look we are getting messages your vulnerability from vulnerability exists from your name which absolutely is identified as Islamic often from your clothes, which are seen as Muslim. In fact, the Prime Minister one even said, you can recognize the protesters gee, from their clothes. Gee, bilkul, bilkul. In other words, everything that identifies you in terms of Islam has made you feel, not you, but Muslims feel scared, vulnerable, threatened. Suddenly they look as if they're targets that can be easily picked upon. Yes, yes. And people um, warn each other when relatives are traveling by train uh, to be careful. To don't speak loudly, don't discuss politics. Um, there's a, there's a, there's a friend, um, uh, a doctor at Ames, who travels frequently to Aligarh. His family lives there, and his great tragedy has been that he no longer carries back kebabs that his or food that his mum would always send back because it, he because, would be identified as Muslim. Because if he the fear that there is some non-vegetarian food in his packet. Um, and this is a this is a highly educated medical doctor practicing in Ames. Uh, he's a Sarkari official, but he happens to be Muslim. You and know, when he told me, this is particularly telling because parents all over the world, no doubt, tell their children, "Be careful when you're on a train." But that's for security reasons. Here, Muslims are telling their family members, "Be careful," not just for security reasons. Be careful. Yad rakho, you're Muslim. You could be picked and targeted for that. There's a wholly different level of fear and threat. There is, I'll tell you my story, I'll tell you a, st a, sh a little story and this is way before Mr. Modi, way, way, way. I used to travel a lot to Banda. Uh, I was doing, I was, much of my work was with Dalit women and on rights of Dalit women. Uh, this must have been some 20, 20 years ago and I was on a train and uh, uh, these were times when one was far less aware of my Muslim name. And a gentleman sitting next to me, he offered me some food or an apple or something. I think it was an apple. Uh, and, and I said, neighbor, yeah, I'm, I'm not fond of apples. And he said, beta, le lo, hum bhi to Hindu hain, hum kaun se musalman hain. And he said this because I had my bindi. And that moment, I, that, that moment stayed with me. Um, so what I'm saying is the fault line was there. It is now into, look, we're in a completely different phase now. We are now in a phase of open threat, open violence, great vulnerability. State institutions are not with you. Uttar Pradesh is a nightmare, especially for Muslims in small towns, people who belong to a lower income strata, who do not have access to any support structure. There is grave fear. And, and this is a fear that you live with on a daily basis. What is the reason behind ghettoization? It's not because Muslims only like to live with Muslims, because Muslims are not being rented homes in other places. Sometimes they will flock together because at least there's a bunch of us here. If there's there is protection. an attack, there is protection. There are so many so reasons for this. Me this. Are Muslims beginning to feel? that they've become second-class citizens in the land of their birth. And worse still, 
that they are treated like second class citizens by some of their neighbours? I would say sadly yes. I think that it does not need uh, a statutory distinction right now to create the kind of look basically bottom line is this if a Muslim and a Hindu suffering the same egregious violation by anybody can go equally to a police station and and get justice from a court then we're equal but that doesn't apply but to India. if that is not the case and the Muslim will have a much harder time either filing his case or in getting justice from a court of law then we are talking inequality and we are talking second class citizens if every symbol in the history of India that comes from a very rich tradition from a rich past if you see names being obliterated from streets from towns across this country then yes you begin to, to feel that you're not the same as, as everybody. In fact when names are obliterated from cities and streets and towns you feel as if your identity is being deliberately wiped out. Yes, it's, not just, it's just it's not acknowledged, it's being wiped out. Yes, yes. You so you exist, you exist, don't be visible, don't make a noise, don't make demands on the state. All of this is second class status, isn't it? You mentioned the police a moment ago and it occurred to me that for millions of Muslims, just like for millions of other Indians, particularly poor ones, Sometimes the first point of contact with the government, often the only point of contact with the government is the police, Ji. the Thanedar or the Daroga. Ji. Do Muslims actually ever believe that this policeman will give them justice? Look, in, in desperate situations, people will go to the police. It's not as if Muslims across India have stopped going to police stations. In desperate situations, you have no choice. In desperate situations, look, do, 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 you, do you, look, I'll ask you. Do you fancy going to a police station? There is something about the image of a police station and about the idea and so let's not make this only about but Muslims. But is it worse for Muslims? Of course it's worse I'll, and, I'll, and I'll give you a concrete day before yesterday in Northeast Delhi of the thousands of things that people said to us. Do you know the one startling omission they did not say? They, there is no mention of wanting to lodge FIRs of wanting to seek justice. That is, so when the police becomes part of the attackers, when it is seen as complicit, omission and commission both for citizens, for these vulnerable Muslim citizens, the furthest thing from their mind is, can I go to that police station and file an FIR for everything I've lost? But this Nobody means, mentioned it. But this means they've actually lost faith in the police. Yes. They've lost faith. Now, if you begin to lose faith in justice, then you begin to lose faith in the idea of full citizenship. There is, there's already the, the compromise. It was as someone who has witnessed and worked on legal cases and encouraged people to file. We came back and it was startling. Nobody mentioned justice. Because they don't believe it will come their way. Everyone talked only about relief rehabilitation anger fear but fir lodge karna hai we want to go to the police station nobody mentioned it and no one mentioned this critical concept of nyay justice it's what we all live for but muslims don't believe they'll get it which is why they don't talk about it that's what i saw day before yesterday one more in delhi Ji. muslims in india frequently hear mohan bhagwat and the rss say no matter what your religion india's culture is hindu india's culture is hindu what do they feel when they hear this? Do they see it as acceptance of a historical tradition or do they believe this is an attempt to deny them once again their identity? Of course they see it as an attempt to deny them their identity and that's what we saw when, so you know, when we saw the anti-CA and RC protests and you saw large numbers of Muslims in them, although you saw a large numbers and I have to say this having been to every protest site in Delhi um, and in others in other states as well there are a large number of Hindus, Dalits, Sikhs also but yes what were these all these Muslims they were trying to reclaim 
their, their citizenship. They were trying to reclaim all the symbols of being Indian that were being taken away from them over all of this, the 370, the Babri Masjid judgment, all of that. This was a coming out and saying, I will, and they succeeded in, in, in reclaiming it. I'm so glad you brought up those protests because I want to end by talking to you about them and their significance. Whether we talk about Shinebagh in Delhi, Azad, Azad Maidan in Bombay, Calcutta or Bangalore, the one thing that was common to all of them is that protesters had the constitution in one hand, the flag in the other. And whether they wore scalp caps or hijabs on their lips was commitment to the constitution, pride in being India. How significant is that? Huge. It's huge, Karan. After a, after a decade of silence, and after the, the absolute assaults by this government uh, on the idea of citizenship, this movement, this outpouring, has, you know, we, we think people don't know the constitution. We think nobody reads it. But what we fail to realize is that the idea of equality, because the constitution has to rest on that foundation alone. <coughs> Pardon me. The idea that we are all equal. That has seeped deep into every soul. The idea that you can actually take equality of this country away from me is something that has caused, it's like a volcano. It's a resistance to snatching away the idea of equality. And it's been beautiful, it's been moving, it's been spontaneous, it's been powerful, and it is a reclaiming. Look. India cannot, will not take, this is the soul of India, India will not take the assaults on its core so easily. That's what this movement has been One about. One more question. Ji. There's been a view that for whatever reason, economic, social, psychological, Muslims have kept aloof from the mainstream. Do you believe now with these protests, not only are they asserting themselves and demanding their rights, but more importantly perhaps, along with Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, they're consciously and deliberately saying, we are the mainstream of this country, we belong as much as anyone else. And do you see that as a significant shift? Do you see it as a turning point? I actually, I don't agree with you um, that uh, Muslims have kept out of the mainstream. That's been the impression people Muslims have. have been kept out of the mainstream. Ah. That's a different articulation, right? It's not that Muslims have, have kept themselves out. The mainstream has denied them. But an then equal now space. the Muslims are saying, we're going to open that door and come in. You cannot keep us out. We are the, we are, look, everybody is the mainstream. The idea that there is a mainstream that can somehow pulverize and ghettoize such a large section of India's population, it's an untenable idea. And, and that's what this, this, these protests mean. I think these protests are a milestone. I think that this movement is a milestone. And, and I think it will, it will continue in new forms. Let me phrase it like this. The door had been shut on them. They've opened it themselves and walked through and said, you're not keeping us out. We're as much a part of this country as anyone else. Yes, absolutely. It is a reclaiming of everything that, that the system and ideology has tried to, to deny to them. And, and I can tell you that the, the constitution and the, and the tiranga, this is not optics. There is some, this is, this is real. This is coming from a very deep passion. You have to read the poetry that is coming out about Hindustan in these, in these protests. This, this is not about a game of optics that let's be clever and hold up the constitution. This is coming from the most deep seated faith and conviction, you know, which is why earlier when you asked me, uh, do they feel that they are not wanted? I don't even think that this not wanted because who is somebody to not want me? This is, this is my country. This is where my grand, uh, uh, my, my generations have been buried. This is the country I fought for. This is a country I chose to be in. Um, will this also then change the way the rest look at Muslims? Do you think it'll, it'll open up the eyes of others to realize and say, ye to mere bhai hai. I've been mistreating them. I think this is a question you need to ask somebody else. 
Um, I don't know what the perceptions of it, uh, uh, how they are going to change. But I can certainly tell you that something significant, uh, something nothing short of revolutionary has happened in this movement. Um, uh, a silence has been broken. And sometimes the sounds of silence can be very powerful. Faranakvi, a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Karan. Thank you. To receive instant updates on all videos from The Wire, click the subscribe button and hit the bell icon. Pay to support independent journalism. Click the link in the description and choose the amount you want to pay.